of 500,000 civilians, to the petroleum workers of America, the prologue of this film is dedicated to the rugged workers of the field and to their unstarred generals of the Petroleum Administration for War, who never in four years have forgotten that 8,000 gallons of high-octane fuel are required for a single mission of one super fortress, who, closely collaborating with the Army and Navy, discover, produce, process, and deliver 21 million gallons of aviation octane a day, and all the lubricants and ordinary gasoline that must accompany them. Without them, this story cannot be finished. Without them, this convoy and tomorrow's convoys never could sail. Their starting point could be any western hemisphere port. Let's make it Texas and follow the oil the long, safest way round. Round the Cape to Calcutta, 14,000 miles to Calcutta, gateway to India and Burma, cellar door to embattled China. Docking facilities are tremendous. Freighters unload here in 48 hours, compared with seven days in pre-war times. Their cargoes including thousands of ingenious containers for oil and gasoline, especially designed for long hauls by air, like the airplanes that carry them, combining great tensile strength with astonishing lightness. the west collides with the east. Coolie power serves canned horsepower. The scene may be duplicated dozens of times in many ports. For two years since the Quebec conference, this drama has grown and spread and quickened, combining the primitive and the modern. Never for a second could the drive be slackened or any means of oil transport be despised. This is the territory that must be reached and served, almost a third as large as North America. A station in recently embattled Burma, a thousand miles from Calcutta, a thousand miles across jungle and desert and mountain, much of it Jap disrupted. When these scenes were photographed, it had been nailed down, made secure. But before an airstrip could be built, all this equipment had to be flown in, in pieces, welded together and all this equipment thirsted for fuel and oil. This was one base among dozens, depending on petroleum. Every day, every hour, bombs earmarked for Mandalay and Rangoon roll gingerly across fresh graded airstrips. And every hour, high octane from cracking plants 16,000 miles away came sprinting forth to hoist these iron eggs of liberty. Yes, there goes a lot of airplane and enough gas to take all Edmonton on a picnic. Now this is a section of an immemorial transit system of India. Very likely this tributary of the Ganges was carrying freight in 1000 BC. And it carried our fuel too in its leisurely way until we grew impatient. Then we took the drums off the barges which could have spent a week toiling up from the sea and hustled them over to trucks and whisked them in a matter of 10 minutes or so to a somewhat snappier means of conveyance, a C-54. Now, considering the grace of this aircraft and its reputation as a luxury airliner, it seems profane to describe it as a flying tank car, but that happens to be precisely what it is. Back there on the river barge, some precious cans of high octane wallowed along at five miles an hour. From this point on, the pace will be brisker. For you are here about to sample one of the most romanticized adventures of them all, to wing across the tallest mountains known to man the unexplored Himalayas in the corner of Tibet. 
you are flying the hump. The jungle wreath Himalayas studded with death. Yet planes now master the Earth's biggest bumps once every two minutes to reach Kunming, back door and storehouse of free China. And so here are 12,000 pounds of petroleum for the arsenal for the coming offensive. But it took a lot of gasoline to get them there. If military security allowed a recitation of statistics at this point, you would be astounded at the oil tonnages that have flown into this back country, medieval city of Yunnan province. It is safe to say that more petroleum has come by aerial tank car, such as this converted Liberator bomber, than ever traveled the Burma Road in its prime. Kunming, of course, is not the end of the line. It stands in the remotest rear echelon, as remote from modern westernized China, which the Japs captured, as Alaska from Chicago. Here, an utterly primitive town, normally of 40,000, swept to 500,000 as Chiang Kai-shek traded space for time. Flying tank cars were not the complete answer. Pipelines were. For military security's sake, we show only a portion of one covering a distance comparable to a line from New York to Winnipeg. The pipelines and the completion of the Stillwell Road were projected together at Quebec in July 43 and executed collaboratively. They are mutually dependent. They were partners. Fuel in great bulk was essential for the operation of the one great surface artery to China for the highway must replace, and at multiplied capacity, the Jap blasted Burma Road. Reciprocating, the Stillwell served the pipeline at a hundred points with materials in long hauls and short. But very often the pipeline couldn't wait for motor caravans to labor across the mountains of Assam. And this was another answer. 12,000 pound shipments vaulting across a mountain range in half a day. Flying pipe for the core of the Sikhs, those handsome straight bearded ones, specialists of mechanics and military arts. These lengths of Pittsburgh alloy could have been at sea day before yesterday, and this morning they clatter up the still well to an Indian pioneer company working under Yankee supervision. Next week they may pulsate with oil, these lines, with petroleum, the blood of the mechanized legion. So the pipeline fed a bulldozer, and the bulldozer hacked out petroleum's right of way. Indian pioneers marched a pipe length behind with half-ton sections of the great conduit, and as U.S. soldiers joined it, Indian lads with machetes cleared the jungle to Burma. To this primitive railway, shell-torn, bullet-shredded not long ago. And now as the Burmese and Indian war refugees return to their recently embattled homeland, we give you something very special in ingenuity and audacity. A hundred-mile rail line whose principal motive power is that hardy campaigner, that doughty, unconquerable prime mover, the one and only Jeep. These improvised locomotives, their crews and line maintenance men were flown in here while the Japs still occupied much of the right of way. Jap guns remind the army engineer how he rode her with his finger on the trigger. 
Yes, there was a war on as pipe supplies raced toward forward bases. Bombers wrought this destruction in the liberation of Burma. Here at Bamo, in a shattered Buddhist temple, not long after the fall of Mandalay, we meet the generals who blasted the Jap from the critical territory near the Stillwell Road and so secured forever the China lifeline. We find them in an early morning conference. Supreme Chief in the victory, General Sultan, then India-Burma commander. General Davidson, 10th Air Force. General Chung, our Chinese ally. Not far away, another errand for the gasoline you've sacrificed. An air evacuation operation over blasted, recently captured Lashio at the start of the old Burma Road. These lightning deliveries from remote, inaccessible battle lines rank with sulfur and plasma in the saving of the wounded. Speed is life in five cases out of six. And speed is another word for high octane. This film chronicle records an actual clock trip. Starting at 3 p.m. from an outpost in the tangled Burmese jungle, a casualty of this noon's fighting has reached Lido in India by 5 p.m., reached a great American general hospital, treating 20,000 a year. As for this lush hospital facility, this was a malarial swamp three years ago. Today, 24 acres of vegetables, including broccoli, cultivated by hand at first. And then when the pipeline passed by, blossoming into something nearer mass production, radishes and scallions, and all it takes to delight the convalescent. Yes, the pipeline passed by and went on, up toward its loftiest, most difficult terrain in India, to a routine little tussle with a thousand-foot gorge rising 400 feet above the river Logalai. So this is India, mysterious Mother India, the same ageless India Kipling wrote a shelf of books about. But Pipeline Joe's only heard of these marbles everybody talks about, like the Taj Mahal at Agra, the most beautiful of all tombs. An emperor brought its stones from many lands, spent 17 years building it for the queen he couldn't forget. But Joe hasn't seen it. He's never even seen an elephant. And he'd like to get up to the new capital, New Delhi, and see the great mosque they tell about in the guidebooks, one of the wonders of the east, of alabaster and marble set here and there with gold and jade that would cost a Maharaja's fortune. Yes, a lot of guys rave about wonderful Delhi. Others gab about Calcutta. But Joe's just been here 15 months building Uncle Sam a pipeline. Capricious climate, like this in early morning. Baking, steaming by noon. That spring in eastern India, when the pipe joints sizzle. That's India as the monsoons begin, the wettest spot on Earth. From June to September, the deluge totals 400 inches of rainfall. But petroleum's march never loses its cadence. Well, boulder together, hold up our average. There are mountains ahead, mountains ahead, and then China. Now this remote rear echelon section is nowhere near the end of the line. But as thousands of Chinese come rushing out to labor over it to help the wizard welder from the west, one realizes that a climax has been reached, a climax that all these humble ones deeply feel and share. After so many years, the fresh blood of freedom has come. A link has been forged, a linking of peoples. No flags fly, no trumpets sound. But this is the scene of a major victory, a pledge kept, a compact fulfilled. For every mile of Stillwell's highway, every gallon of petroleum streaming from 16,000 miles away, every drum of high octane that flew the hump, 
was an element in this master strategy of the China lifeline, the preface to this hour on the horizon of China's victory. Her victory, our victory, our indivisible victory. These China are your allies today and tomorrow.